a huge round of applause and welcome, please, for Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Good morning. Thank you for coming so early. I usually do a lot of Bitcoin conferences, so I'm not quite used to seeing so many suits. Woo! But that's okay. It's a big space. We can all enjoy it. Um, we're going to be publishing this video on YouTube in a few weeks, so um, feel free to take some photos, but please do not live stream or record this and post this on your own at the kind of quality you get from a shaky cell phone with people talking all around you. I'd appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming today. The title of my talk is Misdirection. Thoughts on the future of programmable money is just the generic title I give for every talk I give, and then I change it just before I get up on stage, because this is all improv, folks. I'm going to be talking about universal basic finance. That's the topic of my talk today. We're at the moment at a crossroads where we're having a great debate about the future of cryptocurrency, about the future of finance. And a lot of people are expressing some very strong opinions, myself included. The backdrop to all of this is all of the people who aren't in this room, who will never be in a room like this. In 2013, I visited for the first time the beautiful country of Argentina, and I did a talk in Buenos Aires. And it completely changed the direct direction and trajectory of my involvement in Bitcoin and open blockchains. For the first time, I didn't need to explain why. Why Bitcoin? Why open blockchains? Why freedom of finance? Everybody there was interested in one and only one question. How? How do I do it right now? Because the why is obvious. It's obvious to people from Argentina. Someone came to me at the conference and said, "You've inspired me today. I was terrified to come to this conference. I was afraid of what might happen if our government changes again." My grandparents were kidnapped by the previous regime. We didn't see them for months. We thought they'd thrown them out of an airplane. Think about that for a second. We talk about financial inclusion, we talk about the banked and the unbanked, and we have no clue in our position of privilege what this means. It shook me to the core. And I've had conversations like that every year since I've started working in this space. People who come to me and say, I hear you, because that's my story too. What does it mean? to be unbanked. The World Bank defines unbanked as the two and a half billion people who have absolutely no access to financial services and live in cash-based societies. Conveniently, they only count heads of household, meaning the spouses and children are unimportant in this calculation. Only the primary earners matter. And yet we know that in the vast majority of the world, finance is controlled by women. They are not counted as the head of household. To be unbanked is not to simply have only access to a cash-based society. To be unbanked is to lack connectivity to the world. It is to lack the ability to participate in trade and commerce, to be able to get a job that connects you with other people who want your services around the world to build a future for your children. It is to be condemned to poverty. And when we look at that, what do we think? They don't have money, that's why they're unbanked. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. They don't have access. They don't have documentation. They don't have the necessary literacy to fill in an application form. And sometimes they don't have the clothes or the shoes or the appearance 
to even be able to enter a bank without getting kicked out by the security guard. That's what it means to be unbanked. And what does that do? It creates enormous poverty around the world, just so we can persist in this petty bourgeois idea that as long as we have every participant in every transaction prove their identity, and we can track and control every transaction through this totalitarian surveillance system, we will end crime. And in order to believe in that false idea of safety through totalitarian control, we condemn billions of people to poverty. Billions of people, not two and a half billion. Many, many more. We talk about financial inclusion from the perspective of the rich and privileged world we live in, the, the world I live in. As an American citizen, I have access not only to open a bank account, but also to trade in multiple currencies without restrictions, access to unlimited investment opportunities all around the world, access to capital, liquidity, and credit, the stability of a currency that doesn't destroy itself overnight, taking my entire savings with it, and hopefully most of the time, access to institutions that are not actively stealing my money, or governments that are not actively destroying the currency in order to pay off their debt through shadow inflation, hyperinflation, and then finally financial collapse. How many people have that? Everyone in this room, probably. But if you count all of the people around the world who have access to that kind of financial service, it's maybe a billion and a half. And that's why, after 2013, I started saying strongly and loudly, this is about the other six billion. That's what financial inclusion means. Our regulatory system is actively excluding people from access to finance. We have finally reached a point where access to the most basic financial services has become a privilege. A privilege that the average person has to exercise this dance of proving themselves worthy in front of a banker of filling in reams of paperwork and application forms in order to be granted the privilege of financial services. And we even turn around and condemn cash, the ultimate peer-to-peer, -peer, anonymous, fungible mechanism that for millennia has provided financial services to everyone, basic financial services. And cash has one fatal flaw, and it's not that it's anonymous, that it's its greatest feature. And it's not that it's used by criminals. Criminals get a banking license and defraud people by the millions. Its greatest feature is that it is available to everyone without vetting. Its greatest feature is that it is an open transparent, neutral, verifiable, peer-to-peer -peer transactional system. And its greatest weakness is that it is constrained by geography and locality. It doesn't have range and scale. And now we have a new form of digital cash, which is also open. And it's also neutral and verifiable, unforgeable, transportable. But this one is borderless. It's censorship resistant. It can be used even when your government doesn't want you to use it. It can be used without privilege, without identity. And it can be used everywhere in the world by whoever wants to use it, by simply downloading the software and running it on whatever computing device they can afford. That is the real revolution here. And while we're having a little privileged discussions about should we regulate crypto, how much should we regulate crypto, who should regulate crypto, fuck that. 
Crypto is about providing universal basic finance to whoever needs it, everywhere in the world, whether we like it or not. And what will people do with universal basic finance? What they've done for millennia with access to cash, they will build a future for their children. We are paralyzed by the fear of a few bad actors, blinded by the fact that the worst actors are the ones who act with state privilege and endorsements, with the intelligence agencies hand in hand, inside the surveillance capitalism mechanism to fund dictators and drug lords all around the world with our tax money to the tune of trillions. The real terrorism, the real drug financing doesn't happen in cash. It happens in millions of barrels of oil and billions of pallets of dollars transmitted through wire transfers by the banks who get caught again and again and again and again. And they pay a fine that is a fraction, not only of the criminal behavior that they profited from, but of the tens of thousands of deaths they have directly contributed to. And not a single person goes to jail. And at the same time, some people have the audacity to say that we need to end cash. Why should we give illegals bank accounts? That's a chilling statement to make. Let me translate it to you in words that will make more of an impact. Those people don't deserve the privilege of financial inclusion. Those people. When your neighbor says, those people don't belong in our neighborhood, it freaks you out because you suddenly realize you're living next to a bigot. But when a banking regulator says, why should we give illegals a bank account, I calmly responded, you shouldn't. We will. At the last conference I attended, after I gave a speech decrying the lack of security and financial inclusion, a young man came to me and said, this really spoke to my personal story. A young man in his 20s has been living in Western and developed countries for the past 15 years, has not been able to open a bank account in 15 years. Every time I write my name and place of birth in the application, the process has already ended. I was born in Iran. I didn't choose that. I didn't do anything. I pay my taxes. I have a job. All I want is to deposit my paycheck in a bank account so I can buy groceries. For 15 years, I've been unable to do that. That is the face of the unbanked. There are people walking the streets around you in this city of privilege, in the independent district of the city of London, bought and paid for by banking corporations, in this little enclave that is the Vatican of capitalism, a city within a city. People walking around you, invisible people, your janitors, your service professionals, the people making you a sandwich who don't have a bank account, who take their paycheck in cash, and they go to various places in order to ask for payday loans. Maybe they take a check or other form of payment they can't deposit, and they get charged 10 or 15 percent or 30 percent to send money home to their loved ones so they can support a basic life of subsistence. That's the unbanked. They're right here in this city. Don't imagine the great masses of Africa. Of course, they're unbanked, or Southeast Asia, or South America, right here, your neighbors. And they have been made to live in that position just so we can continue this illusion that safety comes 
from totalitarian surveillance. This very conference is being sponsored by a company that is spreading around millions of dollars in marketing that does surveillance, that is actually promoting and advancing the state of the art. You all have their name on your badge. Look down and check it out. A company that builds state-of-the-art surveillance and then shares and sells that data to companies that further pro progress that data to intelligence agencies. And this lovely form of trickle-down surveillance eventually reaches some regime that likes to cut up journalists with hacksaws. Don't fool yourself. There is no ability to separate your position within a company like that from the moral implications of your actions. And I say to you, if you're hiring people and you see names like that on the resume, just like if I was hiring people and I saw General Dynamics, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, or any of the companies in our space that are promoting and actively pursuing surveillance technology to sell it to the highest bidder, they have declared moral bankruptcy. If you declare moral bankruptcy, you should have seven years of trying to find a job and being interrogated about your ethics. Just like one of the poor people whose life has been stuck in a box of poverty will have to spend seven years trying to prove to a banker that they have the level of privilege to get banking. We have to make some deep moral choices at the moment. We stand at a crossroads because right now the world governments are trying to abolish cash. They are trying to abolish the very last lifeline that remains for the billions of people who have a life of poverty. Not because they don't work, they work harder than all of us. Not because they don't deserve, but simply because of where they were born, or what documentation they have, or what level of literacy they have, or even how they look. In Saudi Arabia, women are not allowed to own property and bank accounts. And this is the case in half a dozen countries around the world. And we look at that and say, shame on them, that's immoral, that's disgusting. And then we turn around and we do the same thing to immigrants in this country and my country. I'm half British, half American. I have to apologize to 194 countries around the world the moment I arrive. And I know in my heart, that every time I pay taxes, I am killing thousands of people by proxy. I still pay, because I am also helping people who are in welfare, people who need help. But most importantly, when we make these moral choices, we have to understand. Surveillance never stopped crime. Surveillance is the license given to the people who are on the top of that to control our lives. They will commit crimes. They will commit the worst of crimes, what I call mega-crimes. I know Britain doesn't use the metric system, so mega is the prefix we use for millions. A mega-crime is one where, for example, you foreclose on a million homeowners and don't go to jail. That's a mega-crime. We are doing surveillance and analytics, to catch a petty drug dealer who is selling pot for Bitcoin. Who is doing surveillance and analytics on Lockheed Martin? Who is doing surveillance and analytics on the money laundering banks? Nobody. Do you know why? None of them ever go to jail. The regulators are completely captured. and The very system of controlling finance from above, by having levers of power over the lives of millions of people, billions of people, of having the audacity to cut off entire countries and say, well, they're under sanctions. They're not privileged enough, they're not people enough to gain financial services. Guess who that attracts? If you build levers of power like that, the very worst sociopaths in our society are attracted like flies to shit to grab hold of those levers of power and destroy all of your freedoms as quickly as they can. We are building societies in which one bad election is the last election.
And if you don't believe me, look at what's happened in Turkey, what's happened in Russia, what's happened in Venezuela, what happens every day to billions of people around the world. Let me end on a positive note, because you're probably a bit freaked out by all of this. You should be. This is serious stuff. Open, borderless, public, transparent, neutral, censorship resistant, strictly private cryptocurrencies exist. They will not be regulated. They cannot be regulated, not by committees, because they are regulated by mathematics. They are regulated by algorithms. They provide certainty of transaction. They provide programmable customer protection. They provide reputation management. They provide access without identity. They give billions of people, eventually, not just a bank account in their pocket, but a bank in their pocket. They democratize the function of banking and turn it into an app that everyone can access without vetting. Because they've already pre-vetted. They have agreed to download the software that follows the rules of consensus. And that is the only vetting required in these systems. But we shouldn't allow that. We did. But we can't have people make anonymous transactions. They will. But we must regulate this. You can't. And you won't. Because six billion people need this. And you have neither the moral authority nor, more importantly, the practical capability to stand in their way or even to stand in the way of what is going to be the greatest revolution in financial services in three centuries, universal access to basic finance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, thank you. I got a bit emotional there, but that's okay. We should be emotional about these things. We should. We should feel. Without feeling, if we mechanize everything, we lose contact with our humanity. I'd like to take questions from the audience. We have a few people with microphones. If you raise your hand, people with microphones will swarm to your location. Hey. Over here. Go for it. It's working. Oh, Andreas, thanks for the talk. That was Good very morning. cool. Yeah, um, you talked about um, uh, private transactions and chain analytics. Can you please explain? What, I mean, we have coin joints now. We have quite a few implementations of coin joints. Can you explain to us how coin joints will make their business model irrelevant and how they won't make any sense, pretty much? Thanks. Thank you so much. Coin join isn't really a specific technology. It's it's a model for doing multi-party transactions. So in uh, cryptocurrencies that use a uh, a transaction coin model or UTXO model like Bitcoin and many of its variants, um, you can do a transaction that is a multi-party transaction. A transaction is not from to with a single party from and a single party to. A transaction has inputs and outputs in crypto like Bitcoin. And what that means is the inputs which are each signed independently and the outputs which are each delivered independently don't have to belong to the same people. So imagine as if you write 20 blank checks that are signed by 20 people who control that money. You put them in a big bucket, and then you hand them out to various people you need to pay. And everybody can make sure that the person they wanted to be paid is paid. But eventually, you can't tell who paid who, or who was even participating. That's called a coin join. There are a number of different technical implementations for a coin join that allow parties to collaborate. The greatest, largest coin join happened two days ago. It had 100 participants, uh, so 100 people paying in, uh, 100 payouts. Um, and these kinds of things, because of the architecture of the system, fundamentally undermine 
the attempts at analytics, but not enough, because you can still do statistical analysis on these in order to connect one of these transactions to the KYC endpoint of an exchange, which is a, a big source of surveillance uh, data, and use that to de-anonymize participants and payments. So, CoinJoin isn't enough. And in fact, the European Union has now said that uh, participating in a coin join is illegal. And the other six billion don't give a shit. <laughs> They've already been called illegals. They've been called illegal people. So if illegal people commit illegal acts, whatever, what are they going to be? Double illegal? <laughs> when an act like that is the difference between you feeding your children or not, then the law is immoral itself. And I'm not encouraging people to break the law. I'm encouraging people to achieve justice by the means they have at their disposal. CoinJoin is not enough because we also need to obfuscate the amounts of payments. And that is an entire area of science called zero knowledge proofs and range proofs confidential transactions where the actual value of the payment is encrypted so you can't see how much money is being transferred which breaks the statistical analysis even further but in order for these tools to be effective at providing people the universal privacy that we have with cash which for thousands of years gave people the freedom to transact and apparently did not result in the end of civilization um, we need to go further we need to have these tools on by default in every wallet and so in some countries that's going to be made illegal and those countries are going to rob their own citizens of the basic elements of financial privacy which is a human right in my opinion but they're also going to do is remove themselves from the innovation train of this technology you can't remove crypto from your country but you can't remove your country from crypto and so many of our governments are trying to do exactly that. Don't worry, there's plenty of people in the world who need it and will not pay attention to any silly law their corrupt governments pass. Who else has a mic? Go for it. Uh, firstly, thanks a lot. Um, so if you look at the traditional financial markets infrastructure, and if you look at what you're defining as universal basic finance, mm -hmm. do you see the two kind of interoperable, or do you see UBF as a complete replacement for the traditional markets? Well, so it depends. There are some functions that you can't replicate with cryptocurrencies. For example, uh, with cryptocurrencies, you can't do fractional reserve banking based on the unlimited printing of currency at zero interest rates, flooding the market with enormous asset bubbles. That's disappointing. <laughs> I mean, how are financial services companies going to make profit without risk, or by externalizing the risk to the entirety of society? It's very disturbing. Uh, we'd better regulate that. Um, you can't do credit in the traditional form. You have to do micro-lending and micro-credit, which is basically not fractional. So you can only generate enough credit as other people see as investment directly. So you can't do those functions of traditional banking. But when it comes to storing currency, that function it is unnecessary to do that function with an intermediary. Everybody can store their own currency, be monetarily sovereign, as they say in the most uh, uh, kind of die-hard angles of crypto. You don't need an intermediary to do payments, international cross-border payments from any recipient to any recipient. That's the fundamental concept of neutrality that exists on the internet, and digital currencies on the internet exhibit that same concept, that same principle of neutrality, and you can't stop it. So those functions do not exist in 25 years in the mainstream banking system, and the reason they don't exist is because no banking system can offer them with the cost, and more importantly, with the openness of open, public, borderless cryptocurrencies. You see, we're seeing a lot of the uh, corporations now trying to compete, and the banking system really uh, is caught between a rock and a hard place, or between a crypto system and Facecoin. Because on one end, here comes crypto, and it's offering an open borderless service that you cannot, by law, you cannot offer, you cannot participate in. 
You can't even play with that technology because you are required under the regulatory regime to KYC everyone you touch and to do all of this reporting. You have been inadvertently or vertently um, deputized into law enforcement. Worse, in the United States now, the banks have been deputized into the military. They have become direct arms of the military. They are fighting trade wars, they are fighting currency wars on behalf of the government. It's a very bad position to be in because you can't play in crypto. You are prohibited from playing in crypto. That's okay. Crypto serves a different purpose. But on the other hand, banks have traditionally been the greatest investors in technology and have prided themselves to be these beacons of technology and innovation. Well, here comes Facebook, here comes Silicon Valley, and they're not going after crypto. They can't. For exactly the same reasons the banks can't. They're regulated entities, they exist in jurisdictions, they're not open source projects that are not controlled by anyone. They're systems that are absolutely centralized and controlled, so therefore they will have to do all of the KYC, AML, and borders that traditional payment systems do. They cannot be open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, transparent, public, immutable. Because all of those things are prohibited under the money transmitter and banking regulations. Therefore, they will be closed and centralized, censorship laden, surveillance driven. And they'll do that better than the banks, faster than the banks, with better interfaces than the banks. And they start out of the gate with two and a half billion customers. You are so screwed if you are in the banking industry right now. It's coming from both ends, and you can't fight either side. But that's okay, because change is good. It's good for consumers. It's good for people. If I was in the banking environment right now, I would be screaming to stop the train of regulation, financial surveillance, and exclusion, because it will bury you without stopping any of your competitors who operate in the open source, borderless environment that the internet is. Next question. Over here. Go for it. Okay, one second. Microphone two. There we go. Uh, thanks, Andreas. That that was an amazing talk. Thank you. My name is Brian Spector. I'm from Credo. We've um, open sourced. Uh, and the question is? A dig yeah. So, uh, um, do you think more enterprises um, from the traditional uh, sort of cybersecurity space uh, will will jump into this market? And uh, what do you think the impact of that will be? Is sort of mainstay technology companies, not just Facebook and Facecoin, but folks like Symantec, RSA, McAfee, sort of jump into this area. What do you think the impact of that will be? So the traditional model of security is one on protecting concentric circles of access um, based on firewalls, based on access controls, based on uh, pro procedural process and operational controls. That model assumes that there is a privileged center that has access to all of the information, and then you have concentric layers which are more and more open, which have less and less valuable information. The problem with that model is that the internet destroyed that model. And the reason it destroyed it is because the center has the most stale, uninteresting information possible, and all of the collaboration and content building and the great richness of our information society operates in the public sphere on the outermost circle. And worse, if you build these types of security mechanisms, you end up isolating the people inside those walls and making it difficult to, for them to access these services. I don't know if you ever tried from a corporate environment to access certain websites that you know are wealth, wealth of information. They have this wonderful resource that you want to download, and it pops up a little message that says, your administrator has blocked access to this website because it contains objectionable material. Well, that is the story of modern security in a nutshell, that little message right there. Um, and this uh, idea of turning inwards and building walls and keeping out the hordes, keeping out the barbarians of the big open public internet, is reflected in our society. It's a medieval idea. It's a medieval idea of castle walls. 
And the problem is that you have to open the gate every now and then to let traders and food in, otherwise you starve. And in the information age, you starve by irrelevance and lack of access to information. So traditional security companies are welcome to come into this new space of open public blockchains. And what they can learn is we have a new model. And this new model is an open public platform that ensures security not by restricting access, but by collaboration through game theory based on incentives and punishments that operate through an embedded monetary system that ensures that people behave according to both self-interest and in alignment with the consensus rules. This is an incredibly powerful new security model for open access to information as well. We can use it to re-decentralize the web. We can use it to open information that needs to be open. It puts the ultimate control and responsibility over security into the hands of the individual key holders who control their own destiny and moves that data back into their hands. It is a non-custodial model for security, which also means a non-custodial model for identity, a non-custodial model for your personal data. We can use this new security model to fix the web, which has lost some of its original promise. But don't fret, because out of the compromised, surveillance-laden web that we have today, out popped the black swan of Bitcoin. It's still capable of delivering surprises. It's still capable of delivering freedom in disruptive viral packages that you cannot stop. And it will do it again and again and again. And now Bitcoin has popped out another 2,000 systems that emulate that model and is exploding that space of innovation. Security has also been massively disrupted by this model. Who's got a mic? Over there. Hi, Anton. Hello. Sorry, Andreas, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is, in order for the universal access to finance that you're talking about to occur, it needs a very sophisticated distributed architecture. Yes. Do you think that there's a risk that regulation will move from the financial rails to the technology architecture itself? And what do we need to be cautious of to stop ISPs stopping software, stopping Apple having the technology on their phone, those sorts of things. I see that as a huge risk. It is absolutely a huge risk. One of the first people to write about that was um, Lawrence Lessig, who wrote a book called Code is Law in the 90s, which was about the fact that our new information realms are defined by laws that are not legislated or voted on, but coded by software entities. And those define the rules of behavior within our information realms. Now, the interesting thing is that open blockchains are also realms where code is law, but the code is actually the rules of consensus that define the law that operates in that realm. Regulation will happen at the fringes, it will happen at the on-ramps and off-ramps of all of these systems. But ultimately, you can't regulate these things out of existence. China has banned Bitcoin more than ten times, the last time very, very strongly, and they really, really meant it this time. Do you think Bitcoin still operates in China? Oh, hell yes, it does. They tried to shut down half the internet to prevent people from saying the magical trigger phrase which will get you knocked off the internet in China. June 4th, 1989. That's the magical phrase that will terminate your internet connection. You cannot stop the truth from propagating on communication media. And you cannot stop computing from being general-purpose computing. You cannot stop any computing from being general-purpose computing, and God knows they're trying. Governments around the world are trying to mandate encryption backdoors, which don't work. And no matter how many technologists explain very, very patiently and very, very politely that you cannot give golden keys to the good guys without giving golden keys to everyone, at which point the bad guys or gals have access. To the same information. You can't persuade these intelligence agencies that keep losing our data and leaking like sieves that they can't do a better job of security than all of the private sector has failed to do already. Two days ago, it was announced that the Customs and Border Protection agents in the United States lost 100 million photos that got leaked from the little cameras you see at the border post, where they take a nice photo of your face, straight on. A really, really nice, well-lit photo 
uh, straight on with your eyes open, no hats, no sunglasses, the kind of thing that's kind of perfect for facial recognition. The bad guys have it now. Be prepared for a reign of terror of surveillance where watching happens bottom up, grassroots with applications on phones, where people can track you from the background of a photo where you appear accidentally. Unregulated people, not dysregulated people like we elect all the time. They will try to make computing non-generic so that they can control the range of expression and experience you can have on computing. It will fail, because it is an armed race against much more creative, much more driven hackers around the world, who have broken every layer of security anyone has put in their path ever to liberate electronic devices. If you want to read more about this topic, one of my favorite authors and speakers and thought leaders on this is Cory Doctorow. And you can learn a lot by understanding his premise on general purpose computing and why the attempts by governments like the UK, primarily, but also France and other European countries, and of course the US, to ban encryption, to control general purpose computing, not only fail, but they create the kind of totalitarian society in which the people who hold those levers of power, the ones who ask you for ID before you look at porn, um, and then leak all of that information all over the internet. Whoops! Um, those are the people who become the most dangerous people in society. Those are the new Stasi. We, we, it is really shocking to me, as someone who was born in this country, to watch this country forget the very lessons that Europe learned 60 years ago, and go down that exact same path, blindly giving enormous power to elected government as if the magic of voting preserves freedoms and institutions. It doesn't. Microphone? Who's got it? Hello. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Building off the question, the past few questions uh, about... I don't know where you are. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Um, so CoinJoin, I think only 4% of coins are held in UTXOs that have been obfuscated. In the last answer, you mentioned that the regulations would happen on the margins on these on and off ramps, but now we have FATFA coming trying to impose uh, the travel rule on these yes. on and off ramps, and 20% of coins are held just in Zappo, Coinbase, Kraken, Binance. Yes. That's not really the margins. It seems to me that there is an immediate threat of kind of a bifurcation of the network, which has been discussed for years, but seems to be coming at us quite quickly. How do you yes. think that might play out in the coming months or years? Financial privacy underpins the right to freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of the vote, freedom of assembly. Because without those basic financial privacy rights, if everything you do can be tracked through your payments, your purchases, then all of your associations and all of your expression and all of your uh, acts of freedom can then be punished after the fact severely enough to deter anyone from exercising those freedoms. We've got to think about two aspects of restraint. One is a priori restraint, right, which is explicitly prohibited in, for example, the U.S. Constitution, um, and of course in the British Constitution. Oh, sorry, uh, tough point there, you don't have one. Um, and so a priori restraint is only one part of the picture, because ex post facto restraint through chilling effects is just as important. We have a situation in crypto today where privacy hasn't been given sufficient importance, and that's a very dangerous path. Um, I believe that the biggest step we need to make in terms of development in Bitcoin, for example, is better privacy. And we see a lot of experiments happening right now, including zero-knowledge proofs and range proofs, that could lead us to higher degrees of privacy. The, the next few proposed improvements to the Bitcoin protocol actually involve very privacy-centric improvements, and I'm very glad to see that. But the other thing you've got to realize is that one of the um, elements of engineering that is almost always true is you don't optimize for a problem that doesn't exist yet. And the problem here is that the erosion of privacy and the ability to do statistical analysis isn't visible to the average user. It doesn't affect them to lose their financial privacy, because most of them already have financial privilege, and they already have very little financial privacy, and they're not being actively persecuted. 
All we're looking for is a couple of direct attacks against people who have lost their financial privacy that way. And what you're going to see is an enormous immune response by the entire crypto space. And it will start developing privacy features faster than you can imagine. We already saw this in the peer-to-peer -peer space with the evolution of Napster. Napster was the friendly, cuddly bear of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. It was the one that wanted desperately to make a deal with the music industry. But they said no, and they shut it down, so Nutella popped up, and they shut it down, so LimeWire popped up, and they shut it down, so BitTorrent popped up, and they can't shut it down. <laughs> they evolved decentralization by creating exactly the kind of hostile stimulus that a directed evolution technology that can move and mutate fast enough by the most creative and determined people who you can't hire because they're not interested in money, win that arms race by evolving and mutating that technology until it can resist the attack. Nicholas Nassim Taleb calls these systems anti-fragile. They're systems that not only resist attack, but in the process of being attacked, evolve strength and become more and more robust. The internet is an anti-fragile system, and open blockchains are anti-fragile systems. I'm not worried. We already have privacy-centric blockchains, and those blockchains are leading the path in terms of research in order to help us adopt these in a more generic way across the board. We've learned the lesson of the internet. The internet had insufficient encryption and privacy, and that gave a lot of governments the opportunity to co-opt our information. Hopefully, we will not repeat that mistake. And so here's my little prediction. Bitcoin is the cuddly little gecko of cryptocurrencies. If they try to stomp on the cuddly little gecko, it will start evolving. It will start evading. It will become stealthier. It will grow teeth and nails. And one day it will become or something very much like it or something that simply has the name but none of the original characteristics will become the Komodo dragon of cryptocurrencies. We also uh, have an indication that probably Bitcoin needs a layer two solution like Lightning Network. If a lot of these microtransactions are taken off on a layer two um, uh, solution, what effect would, could this have on the security of the network, uh, with miners getting less reward? Like That's a great question. Um, so first of all, you've got to understand that this is a natural market-based evolution that is happening in real time. So the reliance on fees versus the coin-based reward or block subsidy, um, that calculation of what's more important doesn't happen some point a hundred years in the future. It happens today. It happens every day when miners do a profit and loss calculation in order to decide how much more equipment to deploy, what equipment to turn off, which equipment is no longer profitable, which equipment is now profitable and should be used more aggressively. They allocate their energy commitment based on this profit and loss calculation. And the contribution of fees to block subsidy has already reached a 50-50 point at moments of very, very high utilization of the network. So this is already happening. When you move transactions to an off-chain network, that has a multiplier effect. And the multiplier effect is not to not have transactions on the base layer. It is simply to say, for every one transaction on the base blockchain, we can do thousands, tens of thousands of transactions perhaps, on the second layer without incurring additional fees. But you still need anchoring transactions to open and close channels. Now, increasingly, what we're going to see is this hybrid environment where your wallet will choose what to do based on the circumstances, the level of fees, the amount of payment you want to make, and it will do intelligent routing, just like we do least cost routing in telephony or uh, shortest hop routing on the internet. And your wallet will do that and make decisions about which layer two networks to use because there won't only be one, and what ratio of on-chain versus off-chain. Now keep in mind, because of technology called splice in or splice out, you can actually combine within a transaction, almost like a coin join that we talked about before, you can have some inputs in the transaction be on-chain redemption of coins that you have on-chain, and some of the inputs be 
channel closing inputs of channels that you're closing in order to rebalance your layer two. At the same time, on the output side, some of them can be direct on-chain payments, perhaps for larger amounts where you want to uh, do it on-chain. It's more effective. But some of the outputs will be channel opening outputs that open new channels to better balance your activity on layer two. There will not be one set of transactions for on-chain and another set of transactions for opening and closing channels. Those things will happen simultaneously. There will be plenty of transactions on the network. In fact, layer two is only the first step in a scaling journey that has to involve hundreds of steps, and infrastructure improvements, and new algorithms, and new ways of balancing the essential requirements of security, scalability, and decentralization in a way that allows us to bring this universal basic finance technology to everyone. We cannot solve this with one magic bullet any more than you can solve the scalability problem on the internet. Because the moment you solve the current scalability challenge on the internet, it opens the door for every application developer to say, huh, I think we can do 4K video now, and then you have a new scalability problem. And you solve that because the internet gets completely flooded and nothing works. And then as soon as you solve that and there's more capacity, the app developers go, VR 4K video. Cool. And then you have a scalability problem again. And I've been watching that play out since 1989 where I didn't have enough bandwidth for text email and then I did and then I didn't have enough bandwidth for sending attachments and then I did but not high resolution images and then I did so I could do voice calls and then etc cetera, etc cetera. this is a continuous development um, the engineers in this room will probably understand me when I say if you give me a fiber connection that offers me a hundred gigabit internet to my home. The first thing I do is I call the internet service provider and I say, "Did you really mean that? Like a hundred? Like can I actually use it?" They're like, uh, "We can assure you, sir. This has happened to me. It was a one gig connection with fiber. Um, yes, we can assure you, sir, that you can use it. Um, I'm not sure if you understand me correctly. I actually can." Use it. I'm an engineer. I can use it. They're like absolutely, sir. No problem at all. An optimized router and switch later. Two virtual servers, and I pegged that connection for 12 months at one gig down, one gig up, 24 hours a day. You give me a hundred gig connection, I'm like excellent. The Internet Archive needs a local mirror. Wikipedia should probably be replicated in every language possible on my little server at home. You give me a terabyte connection, I'm like, here we go, 4K VR video for the world! I can do Netflix from my house, not watch it, serve it to everyone. Any engineer who looks at a capacity limit is immediately thinking, what could I do if it was doubled, tripled, quadrupled? We think Moore's Law. There is no way we can solve blockchain capacity. The moment you solve it, I think microtransactions. The moment you solve that, I think picotransactions in microseconds. The moment you solve that, I think machine-to-machine -machine payments with picotransactions in microseconds happening 24 hours a day on all of the IoT devices. We will always have a scaling problem. What's really interesting to me as a milestone is, when do we get this scaling? to the level where we can start onboarding more and more of the other six billion. And on that note, I'm going to end it today. Thank you so much.